Hello and welcome. My name is Laura Johnston. I am the Scientific Associate Director of the Flow Corps at UChicago. This is the second video in the Flow Basics 2.0 series. My goal for this series is to break down the practical steps of running a flow cytometry experiment and help you understand how each of these steps could ultimately affect your final results. If you haven't watched the first video yet, I would recommend going back and watching that one because this video is going to build on that first Flow Basics video. Um, so in this video, I'm going to talk about how to actually optimize the protocol that I talked about in the first video. Just to remind you what that protocol was, we have... Um, the first step is to, if you have tissue, get those cells out of tissue into a single cell, single cells in suspension. Um, then you would add your FC block, then your fluorescent antibodies, and once those are incubated, bound to the cells, then you would wash away any of the unbound antibody and run it on a cytometer. So first I'm going to start out talking about the tissue digestion process because I didn't touch on that in the um, first video. Now you may be wondering why is the tissue digestion so important? Well there are many digestion protocols and all of these protocols will definitely result in single cells but not all of the protocols are optimized for your actual cells of interest. So you may want to think about what protocol you choose so that you can optimize getting the cells that you're interested in looking at out of the tissue. Um, here's an example from a paper that I found. They looked at three different methods for digesting the spleen. Um, so they have two protocols, the strainer protocol and this manual protocol, which basically just um, mashes the spleen or flushes the spleen um, without any enzymes. And then they had one protocol with collagenase. So one enzyme to break up the tissue. You can see they were looking at dendritic cells. So the number of dendritic cells per spleen for the different methods is different. And then also the frequency of CD8 positive dendritic cells is different. So you can imagine that if your goal of your experiment is to look at CD8 positive dendritic cells, then the protocol that you choose for digesting this tissue will impact your results. Um, so if you want to look at these particular cells, then probably the collagenase method would be the best. Now, how do you actually go about choosing an enzyme or a protocol? Um, unfortunately, this isn't anything that I can tell you. It's something that you're going to have to figure out based on your actual tissue of interest, your cells of interest, your particular experiment. Um, so I would recommend doing some searching on PubMed to try to find papers that have similar goals, that hopefully have protocols that you can follow, or if there are people in your lab that have done these types of experiments already, I would talk to them about if they have tested out different digestion protocols um, and which ones they might recommend. I do have a few generic links. Um, so there's a page on Sigma's website that has a nice overview of the variety of digestion enzymes available and how they differ. Um, and then here's another paper I found that gives you just a really generic overview of digesting tissues and what factors impact the digestion. Um, but just keep in mind that changing the digestion protocol can change your ultimate results. Um, so this figure I think outlines that nicely. We have three different enzyme combinations that this group tested out and then they also tried out 15 minutes versus 60 minutes. And you can see they looked using flow cytometry at these different cell types and the frequency of these cells that they got out of the tissue, you can see was definitely impacted by the type of enzyme and the time 
that the tissue spent in the enzyme. There's also other factors like temperature can affect this, the concentration of the enzyme that you use can affect this. So there's a lot of factors that you might need to play around with to get the optimal results. I do want to point out a couple factors that you should be aware of that can potentially affect your results. So one is that some digestion enzymes could potentially cleave off your surface proteins. So if you're looking at that, you might be losing expression because of the enzyme that you're using. Not, that's not to say that every enzyme does this. Um, trypsin is a particularly bad one. You can see here when trypsin is added, the CD44 decreases on these cells quite significantly. Um, so just be aware that you may run into this issue. You may have to switch the enzyme or switch the concentration or the time in the enzyme or whatever um, protocol steps. Also, the digestion pro process tends to cause cell death or injury. So part of choosing a good protocol or optimizing a good digestion protocol would also involve choosing a protocol that minimizes the amount of cell death um, because the process is going to affect the cells, but you want to minimize how much effect it has, I guess. Um, so just be aware of these. Sometimes they're just unavoidable. It is the nature of flow cytometry. We can't look at whole tissue. You, if you need to look at whole tissue, you've got to go with microscopy. Um, but with microscopy, you can't look at many, many, many cells in a short amount of time. It's a much slower process. So with flow cytometry, we've got the benefit of looking at a lot of cells in a short period of time, but the downside of that is that we may be missing out on some of the cells because we can't always get all of the cells out of the tissue. Um, but ultimately, just remember to be consistent with your protocol, so always using the same time, the same temperature, the same concentration of your digestion enzyme, all of that. So you want to make sure that everything is digested as similarly as possible so that you will be able to interpret your results in the end. I do recommend doing some sort of experiment to optimize your tissue digestion if that is something that you need to do for your experiment. Um, so this is an example of a test that I did in grad school. I was trying to look at basophils in the lung and I tried four different protocols. So I tried different ways of mincing up the tissue. So either just cutting it up into small pieces with scissors or using Milteni's Gentle Max instrument. Um, and then I also tried two different enzymes. So this is sort of the old school one, just collagenase and deinase um, versus I had found a paper that used this combination of enzymes to get dendritic cells out of the lung. Um, which are known to be a bit difficult to get. So I tried out these four different protocols. Here is my results. So Q2 is the base fills, and I ended up going with this protocol with the Gentle Max and the second enzyme cocktail. So you can imagine doing a optimization experiment like that to help you sort of figure out what might maximize your cells of interest. Okay, so now the second step was FC block. We mostly talked about this in the first video, but I just wanted to point out that there are a lot of options for blocking. So again, the basic one is FC block, and most of us get by just fine with only FC block. But if you want to add to that, if you are having trouble with background staining, um, serum is one thought, heparin is another thought that is probably not really well known, so I have a whole blog post on using heparin. It blocks charge-based interactions. And then there's also a reagent, Biologen makes this monocyte blocker, uh, because monocytes can bind non-specifically to fluorophores themselves, so there's a reagent to assist with that. Um, so again, FC block is usually just fine, but if you are having problems, there are certainly other things that we can do 
that you can add to your staining protocol to help with blocking. Okay, so for the rest of this talk, I really want to focus on fluorescent antibodies um, staining surface markers. And we talked about the five different factors in the first video, time, temperature, volume, cell number, and antibody amount. So time and temperature, you really just want to pick one and we will optimize based on whatever you pick. So again, I usually go with 30 minutes at four degrees. Volume, again, something that you just need to pick and stick with. So I always do 100 microliters, but in a couple slides, I'll talk to you about a scenario where you might need to change your volume. Um, so we'll discuss that. But really, I want to get to cell concentration and antibody concentration, because these two are the hardest to figure out and so require a bit more thought than the other three factors where you just kind of have to pick one and stick with it. So which one is more important? Is cell concentration more important? Is antibody concentration more important? Or are they equally important? So I will tell you that, and this may come as a surprise to some of you, uh, cell concentration is actually not extremely important. Um, so I did an experiment where I took mouse spleen cells, I stained them with CD4, I kept the staining protocol exactly the same, the only thing I changed was the cell number. Uh, so I had 10 tubes and stained between a million cells and 10 million cells, and you can see the results here. So these are just histograms that are stacked on each other. And it looks pretty much exactly the same. I took the mean of the positive population. You can see very similar. Um, also looking at the frequency of the positive cells. Very, very similar between the tubes. So not much of a difference, actually. Um, now, I do want to point out that just because this worked for CD4 doesn't mean that every single antibody is going to behave in this manner. There are are certainly some antibodies that are more sensitive to cell concentration than CD4. Um, but in general, if you have to change cell concentration for whatever reason, it's not as much of an issue. On the other hand, antibody concentration has a really big impact on your results. So here's a similar experiment where I kept the staining protocol the same, but I varied the concentration of the antibody or the amount of the antibody, and you can see how much the data changes between these three tubes. So concentration is extremely important for antibodies and less important for cells. But now you're probably wondering how you actually determine how many cells do I need for my experiment and how much antibody should I be using. And these are things that you can actually think about ahead of time and figure out. So for cells, as I mentioned in the first video, the standard protocol is to stain a million cells. But there are certainly experiments where you don't have to stain a million cells that's excessive, or there's other experiments where you're going to need way more than a million cells. So really, there is a way to figure out how many cells you actually need. In order to do that, you need to know the frequency of your rarest population of interest, uh, whether you're looking at if you only have one population that you're interested in examining, or if you have 20 populations that you're interested in examining. Um, you just need to know the frequency of whatever the rarest population is. And then you need to know how many events that you need in that rarest population to be able to actually analyze your data. So usually our minimum threshold is somewhere around 100 to 5,000 or 100 to 500 events in that rarest population. If you can get more events than that, then that's great. Um, but that is your lower limit. Now I do have a pretty extensive blog post that goes over how to think about all the different numbers of cells you need for 
your experiment, your samples, your controls, and all of that. Um, so you're welcome to check that out on our website. I have linked here. Um, but I will go through a couple of the examples in this video. So for the first example, let's imagine that we are looking at immune cells in whole blood and we need to figure out, as I mentioned, what are the cell frequencies in the blood and then really we need to know for our particular experiment what is the rarest population that I'm personally interested in for my experiment. Um, so I will tell you, you know, after you can look this up on PubMed, um, we have a pretty good idea of the frequencies of all the cells in the blood. So if you don't know your tissue of interest, I would suggest doing some searching on PubMed to see if you can get an idea of what you might expect. Um, so we have in the blood about 50% neutrophils, 10% monocytes, 30% lymphocytes, and then if we really want to subset the lymphocytes further, uh, we have about half a percent that are Tregs. So I need to figure out what is my experiment. I kind of have two experiments here. So the first experiment, let's say I have a panel that is focused on myeloid cells, so looking at the neutrophils and the monocytes, which means that my rarest cell of interest would be the monocytes, which is 10%. So if I was to collect 50,000 cells in my um, FCS file, then 10% of 50,000 would be 5,000. So there would be plenty of cells to analyze and that 50,000 cells would be great. Um, now, if I had a different experiment, let's say my panel is focused on lymphocytes and I have a bunch of different subsets of lymphocytes and the rare subset, subset of that is Tregs. So if I look at the blood, the Tregs are half a percent of the whole blood. And keep in mind, it's not half a percent of the lymphocytes unless I had done some sort of um, pre-sorting or, you know, anything beforehand, before I ran it on my cytometer. Um, but I didn't, I just have whole blood, so it's half a percent of the whole blood. Um, so if I collect 50,000 total cells, then half a percent of that is 500. So that is, you know, on the borderline of how many cells I can collect. So that means that if I am using this lymphocyte panel, then I need to collect a minimum of 50,000 cells. If I can collect more than that, then that would be great. Um, but I wouldn't want to collect less than 50,000 cells. For my myeloid panel with the monocytes, um, 50,000 cells would be great. If I didn't have a lot of sample and I was worried about how many cells I could use for my experiment, I could probably get by with less than 50,000, um, but certainly more than 50,000 would be great. So again, this is just kind of how you roughly estimate what you would need. You can see there's some flexibility in what you actually use to analyze your data. I also want to point out how you get this 50,000. Um, so it's not 50,000 events, it's 50,000 cells. So in your total events that you're recording, you're going to have debris, you're going to have dead cells. So if you collect 50,000 events, then you're going to lose some of that to dead cells and debris. Um, and then also, you don't want to stain 50,000 cells and then think that by the time you stain your cells and do all the washes and get to the cytometer, you're going to be able to record 50,000 cells. You definitely will not. So if you're aiming to record 50,000 cells, then you need to stain a lot more than 50,000 cells to account for the loss. Now, I would recommend if 50,000 cells is your goal, I would probably still say 
if you can afford to, if you have enough cells, stain somewhere around half a million to a million cells. But if you're really limited on your cell number, then maybe go down to staining around 100 to 200,000 cells. It's probably okay. Uh, also, if you are sitting here thinking this is a lot more complicated than your actual experiment, let's say you have a cell line and you're just looking at GFP positive cells and that's it. So one color, one cell line. Um, then I would say, you know, somewhere around 10,000 to 50,000 cells should be plenty of cells for you to look at. Okay, so the second part of the experiment, let's say I have done my benchtop analyzer experiment, I've found a difference in my Tregs between my different experimental conditions or treatments or whatever I did, um, and now I want to sort my Tregs and do some sort of functional assay in vitro or do RNA-seq or whatever downstream application I want. But I want to move to a sorter. So this is where um, I mentioned I would talk to you about how you might need to stain in a larger volume than 100 microliters. So if you are moving from the analyzer to a sorter, you might need to scale up your staining protocol in order to get enough cells sorted. So again, you would use the concept of knowing the frequency, so knowing that my Tregs are half a percent of the total cells and then deciding on how many Tregs I need downstream for my experiment um, and then back calculating how many total cells you would need. So um, just remember that your cell concentration is not as much of a factor. Um, so if your original protocol is that you stained a million cells uh, you did that in 100 microliters and you used 0.1 micrograms of antibody. And now let's say you've back calculated for your sorter experiment, you need 10 million cells. So you don't need to use 10 times as many reagents. So you don't need to do 10 million cells with 1 mil staining volume and 1 microgram of antibody. That's kind of excessive. Um, you can see from here, it's probably not going to make as much of a difference. So I would say don't waste your reagents doing that. Um, in general, once I have titrated an antibody, I tend to think that that's good for up to 5 million cells, or somewhere around 3 million to 5 million cells. Um, I don't have any science to back that up though, so take that for what it is. Um, but I would probably start out with, if you're trying to stain 10 million cells, then I would just do that in 200 microliters with 0.2 micrograms of antibody. So it takes a lot less reagents. Um, so just keep that in mind if you need to scale up your staining protocol. Okay, now moving on to antibody titration. Um, so we figured out how many cells we actually need so now we have figured out all the components of our staining protocol except for the antibody concentration. So to figure out the optimal antibody amount, we need to do a titration experiment, which is where we have our staining protocol set except for antibody concentration. And so we will try out different concentrations of antibody and then pick the best one. We tend to do this just so you know, as single stains, we tend to do one color per tube. So this is what I'm showing here. And then um, I want to talk about how the antibody stain pattern essentially behaves. So um, what I did is I basically took these three plots and stacked them on top of each other. Um, that's basically what this um, schematic is. So you can see that at a really high concentration, we have our positive population in red, our negative population in blue. At the high concentrations, if it's too high, we see a nice separation between the positive and negative populations. 
but there is some spread in the negative population because there's so much antibody, we're getting some nonspecific binding to the negative population. So as we decrease the concentration, we can see that this spread in the negative starts to decrease, but we're still getting good separation between the positive and negative. And eventually you'll see that the antibody will not saturate to the positive population, and so the positive population will start moving closer to the negative population as your concentration keeps on decreasing. So that's generally what happens as you change the concentration of the antibody. So for your experiment, like I said, you're going to do single stains with your different antibodies, um, and then you're going to want to use your cells or tissues of interest. Now, if it is difficult for you to acquire your particular cell or tissue of interest, so let's say you are planning on staining tumors, but it's hard for you to get some mice with some extra tumors that you can basically just trash for an antibody titration experiment, I would say instead of skipping the antibody titration altogether, I would at least titrate the antibodies on a different tissue. Um, so ideally, same tissue if you can, but if you can't, then at least use a different tissue that still expresses the marker that you're interested in looking at. You may need to do something to the tissue or the cells. You might need to stimulate them. You might need to treat your mice with something so that you can get good expression of your markers. Um, but once you have the data, then you're going to need to analyze it. Typically, we do that in Flojo or FCS Express. And you might want to calculate the separation or staining index, um, though not everyone does. So the SI basically gives a value to what I explained previously. So the SI takes into account the distance between the positive population and the negative population, because obviously we want these to be as far apart as possible. And then it also takes into account the spreading of the negative population by looking at the standard deviation of the negative population. So for the formula, it figures out the highest SI is where you get the largest difference between the positive and negative populations, but also the least spreading in the negative population. So the SI is just a way to give you a value for that. Um, here is the formula. Um, again, there's a link if you want to read on that further. Separation index is very, very similar. Um, basically, just pick one of the formulas and use that one. So for the full antibody titration protocol, um, there are many, many protocols out there. Um, so in a sense, there isn't really a correct protocol, but I would say that of the protocols, something that looks like this one is probably the most correct protocol. Um, so in this protocol, which if you want to check this out, there's a link here, um, you would stain eight tubes um, with eight different concentrations of your one antibody. So that means if you have five color, five antibodies in your panel, you need to do the eight tubes five times. So you'll have 40 tubes. Um, then you need to calculate the SI for each tube and then graph it to look something like this and then calculate, get a line of best fit and calculate the highest or the antibody concentration that matches the highest SI. Um, so that is the long protocol, that is the best protocol, uh, but to be honest, I don't do this protocol because it is quite a bit of work. And as you can imagine, as your panels get larger and larger and larger, doing eight tubes for each antibody in a 24 marker panel is a lot of tubes. Um, so I personally find this to be a bit too much to handle when you're very, very busy in the lab and you only have so much time to do things. So I instead use an abbreviated protocol, um, which I feel 
you know, although it's not as good as the long protocol, um, it gets me pretty close. So what I do is I do four tubes instead of eight tubes. So each antibody has four tubes. So if you have 10 markers, then you need four tubes for 10 markers, so 40 tubes. Um, and then I do these different amounts, so 0.3 micrograms, 0 0.1, 0 0.03, 0 0.01. You might find that these are sort of unusual sounding, but I do have a purpose for this. Uh, so in grad school, my PI was a pharmacology PhD, and pharmacologists do things in half logs, and the um, fluorescent scale is on a log scale. So it makes sense to do things in half logs. So half logs means that between one and 10, the halfway point is three on a log scale. So you wanna do everything on the ones and the threes. And I start with 0.1 microgram being a very popular good concentration. So I do a half log above that and then two half logs below that. Once you do this experiment on your antibody, sometimes you might find that you have to go a little bit higher than that or a little bit lower than that. But in general, one of these four concentrations will typically work out for me. I don't often have to go higher or lower than these. Um, also make sure you pay attention to the actual concentration of your antibody on the tube. So a lot of antibodies come in either 0.5 mg per mil or 0.2 mg per mil. Um, in the past, the Brilliant Violet dyes have come in really, really unusual concentrations, but just make sure you look at your actual vial so you can figure it out. Um, and then I personally don't calculate the SI. I kind of eyeball it because I'm fairly experienced in this. Um, so if you're newer, you might want to start out with calculating the SI as opposed to just eyeballing it and picking the one that looks the best. <clears throat> um, and then one last note about antibody titration. This is just kind of a personal pet peeve, but also how I um, continue to take shortcuts on things when possible. Um, so as you noticed, I list things in my antibodies in microgram amounts. Um, so. Ideally, knowing antibody concentration megs per mil is the best, but I personally know that I always, always, always will stain in 100 microliters. So all of my antibody amounts are per 100 microliters. Um, and there's a reason why I use the microgram amount and not a microliter amount or something like 1 to 100 or 1 to 800, anything like that. Um, because I like to not spend a lot of time calculating things. <laughs> so the reason is that, let's say I have an antibody, it's clone X, and it's conjugated to PE. I did my titration experiment. I figured out that I use that antibody at 0.1 micrograms. So I finished my experiment, and then several months later, I come up with a new experiment I need to use the same antibody, same clone X, but now for my new panel, it turns out that PE doesn't work for that panel and I need to switch it to Fitzy instead. So instead of retitrating the entire antibody, I'm just gonna use the same amount of antibody. So I'm gonna use 0.1 micrograms of clone X, regardless of if it's conjugated to Fitzy or if it's conjugated to PE. So, that's why I use the microgram amount because you can see that the Fitzy antibody is 0.5 mg per mil, whereas the PE antibody is 0.2 mg per mil. So the actual microliter amount is going to be different. So if I just <clears throat> said that the PE antibody was used at half a microliter, then once I moved on to my new experiment, then I'd have to go back at my look back at my notes or go dig for the vial and figure out what's the concentration of the PE antibody, calculate how many micrograms that is, and then calculate how many micrograms that translates to for the Fitzy antibody, 
extra steps that I don't feel like doing. So if I keep the microgram amount, then I don't have to look up any additional information. So that is personally why I prefer to not keep track of antibodies in 1 to 100 or 2 microliters or any sort of volume amounts like that um, because I do a lot of flow cytometry experiments and I use similar antibodies that are conjugated to different fluorophores and keeping track of them this way means that I can do less calculations and keep track of less information. Um, also, again, just know this is a shortcut. Um, so in an ideal scenario, I would need to re-titrate uh, this new Fitzy antibody, but in general, um, most of the antibody titration has to do with the clone and the fluorophore itself um, usually has less of a contribution to your antibody titration. Um, so as a shortcut, you can often get by with just using the same amount, but know that you might need to change the concentration um, if you change the fluorophore. So that's really it. That's all I have for the basic staining protocol. I know there's things that I did not touch on. Um, I mentioned fixing cells in the first video, but obviously I did not talk about anything intracellular, so cytokines, transcription factors, phosphoproteins, cell cycle proliferation. Um, I don't have videos on that for you, but if you are interested in those and want more information, I have compiled some links for you. So if you want to go to our website, download these slides. Um, I have the links after this, so you can go find those links and learn more about those specific topics. And that's it for this video, so stay tuned for the next video where we will be talking about panel design.